Years before, Marcus Valerius earned his nickname Corvus by defeating a large Gaul with the help of a raven. An oddly similar event took place. In 361 BC, the Romans were defending a bridge against the Gauls in the Battle of the River Anio. Neither side was willing to commit to crossing the bridge, as that would put them at a great disadvantage. An unnaturally large Gaul marched onto the bridge and challenged any Roman to single combat. The sheer sight of him was enough to scare even the bravest man, and the foremost men of the Republic stood in silence. Sensing an opportunity to write his name in the history books, a young man, Titus Manlius, accepted the challenge and faced the brute alone. In one of the memorable duels of the Republic, he leveraged his speed and agility to defeat a far stronger enemy. From his body, Manlius took only a single necklace. This earned him the nickname Torquatus, meaning adorned with a chain, and his place among the pantheon of Roman heroes. After the defeat in the Battle of Suessula, the Semnites sued for peace. The Romans, by now weary of war, agreed to reinstate the treaty between them. Their allies, however, didn't think that this treaty referred to them and marched into Samnium under the Latin leadership. The Semnites took offense with this and requested that the Romans stop this invasion, but they refused to intervene. Latin saw this as an admission of weakness and decided that the time was ripe for renegotiating their place in the alliance. For years now, the Latins were equal participants in all the wars, but they received little glory and even fewer spoils. As they made up half the Roman army, they saw themselves as equals to Romans. The meetings of the Latin League were held in secret, where they were discussing further course of action, but the news of these proceedings still reached Rome. Leaders of the Latin League were promptly summoned to appear before the Senate. It was agreed that the Latins would demand that one of the consuls be elected from their number, and that half the senators are Latins from now on. Lucius Annius was chosen to present these demands in Rome. He was a passionate man and he forgot himself while addressing the Senate, speaking like a conqueror and not like a protected diplomat. His speech enraged the consul Titus Manlius Torquatus, who threatened to personally kill any Latin would-be senator who dared to enter Rome. He then reminded Annius of countless Roman victories over the Latins, the destruction of Alba by King Tullus, campaigns of King Tarquinius, and the crushing defeat at the Battle of Lake Regulus. Livy informs us that during the shouting match that ensued, Anius, conveniently, slipped and hit his head on a hard rock. For Manlius, this was a sign that the gods have declared war on the Latins and that the Romans should follow suit. Two armies were levied and they marched out of the city in a hurry. One was led by Torquatus and the other by Lucius Decius, who earned his acclaim during the First Samnite War. They were joined by an unlikely ally. It was clear that another war was brewing between the two chief powers of central Italy, the Romans and the Semnites. Both sides agreed that it would be best that the Latins were subdued, so they wouldn't even think of intervening in the inevitable conflict. The armies encamped near Capua, where the Latins and their allies, the Volsci, the Aurinci and the Campanians were amassing their forces. In the quiet of the night, both consuls had the same vision. A godly figure appeared in their dream and announced that an army whose commander sacrificed himself in battle would prevail. Both generals wanted this honor, so it was agreed that each of them would command one flank of the army. The consul whose side gives way first will then charge into the enemy line, thus performing devotio. Devotio was a form of ritual sacrifice in ancient Rome, in which a Roman general devoted his own life in exchange for victory. The Latins would prove to be a difficult enemy. Years of fighting side by side made the Latin army indistinguishable from the Roman. They had the same fighting style, the same tactics, and even the same language. The men knew each other personally from years of fighting together. In the heat of the battle, men could be easily confused, so it was paramount that the soldiers were disciplined. Manlius gave the order that no man is allowed to leave his post, under the threat of death. It just so happened that his son, Titus Manlius, was leading a scouting party. When they drew close to the enemy line, he was recognized by the Latin commander, who challenged him to single combat. Fearing that declining this duel would hurt his reputation, he foolishly accepted. Titus easily defeated his foe and returned to the cheers of his men. Not realizing the foolishness of his deeds, he reported everything to his father. Manlius was now forced to choose between his obligations to his house and obligations to Rome itself. On one hand, his son had won glory for his family and on the other, he disobeyed direct orders from the consul and undermined the entire state. To the astonishment and horror of all soldiers, Manlius personally executed his son. He then gave him a hero's funeral, 
presenting him with all the honors of a true Roman champion, thus fulfilling obligations of both state and family. Although the soldiers despised Manlius, not a single instance of misconduct was reported from that day forth. The two armies met at the foot of the Mount Vesuvius. Datius was leading the Roman left and Manlius the right. When the fighting had finally begun, neither side would give any ground. Never in Roman history did the legions fight an opponent so evenly matched. Eventually, the Roman left started giving ground and Datius, remembering his dream, leapt onto his horse. He charged into the enemy line, killing many Latins that stood in his way. When he was finally killed, the prophecy was fulfilled and the reinvigorated Romans pressed forth. The Latin army scattered and the survivors gathered at the city of Vescia. In this story, the ancient authors present another instance of kin slaying, showing us that the men in bygone eras of Rome valued the Republic more than their own families. Just like Brutus killed his sons for treason, so did Manlius kill his son for disobedience. Perhaps they believed these stories could awaken in their readers the fervent patriotism of the time when the Republic faced great peril. Furthermore, Livy questions the actions of Datius, believing his sacrifice was in vain. He believed that any army that was commanded by Manlius would have taken the victory on that day. Modern historians believe that the life of Datius was embellished with events from the previous episode to make this sacrifice more meaningful. With this, we return to the Latins who gathered at Vescia. There they deliberated on their next move. Nomicius believed that both armies had suffered equally and the Roman victory was in name only. But while the Romans were far from home, they could easily gather more troops from the Latins and the Volscians. The leaders agreed and the orders were sent to assemble the men with great haste. When the army was ready, Nomicius marched them out of Vescia and met the Romans in the Battle of Trifano. The Latin alliance was so utterly defeated that they unconditionally surrendered. The territory in Latium and Campania was divided among the Roman plebs. The next year and a half were spent besieging individual towns in Latium. Those that surrendered immediately, or didn't join the rebellion at all, were given full Roman citizenship. Those that fought a little before surrendering were allowed to keep intermarriage and trade rights, but were denied the vote. Those that led the rebellion and refused to surrender were severely dealt with. Their cities were destroyed and the men were banished. Colonists were then sent to occupy that land. This again greatly increased the Roman population. The Latin League was dissolved once and for all and a separate Latin identity was destroyed. This was the last war the Latins waged against Rome. This model of conquest was used by the Romans throughout history. Those nations that were friendly to Rome had preferential treatment and enjoyed greater autonomy. On the other hand, the nations that resisted the Roman legions were utterly destroyed. The most notable examples being the complete demolition of Carthage and the Gallic genocide conducted by Julius Caesar. The end of the Latin War set the stage for one of the most important wars in Roman history, the Second Semnite War. This war, although not as famous, falls into the same category as the Second Punic War. But before we can continue our story, we should stop and examine the evolution of the Roman legion. During this time, a shift took place that allowed the Romans to rise from a regional power to the masters of the Mediterranean. Join us next time as we discuss the Roman military reforms and the introduction of the famous Maniple system.